on episode four of Office Hours with Dr. Guy, solid definitions, body language, and working with crazy chairs. Bring your questions to Office Hours with Dr. Guy. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Office Hours with Dr. Guy, episode four, and I'm so excited that you're here. Already, questions are pouring in, and I greatly appreciate that. The community that has arisen on Facebook is amazing, and uh, those of you that have been loyal and subscribed on YouTube, greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I just want to say, you know, uh, being that it's the middle of the week now, what I can say, for me, I always gauge, like my key performance indicator for my life is knowing how many people that I'm engaged with and talking with on a daily basis about the things that, that I feel like I'm called to do. And what I'm called to do is to bring clarity to crazy, messy projects, including the dissertation, uh, for people that want to go and advance their lives to whatever next horizon that they're journeying towards. And I know that you are headed towards your next horizon and your biggest desire, I imagine, is to finish this dissertation and graduate. So I'm just so humbled and excited to be here with you and be working with you. So for that reason, I covet your questions. And in the middle of the week I'm t today, I'm very happy to know uh, how many of you are asking questions and how many of you are engaging there. That tells me that I'm having a good week. So let's answer some of your questions. Kashia asks, what are some good strategies to make sure your chair does not want to change your topic? Kashia, I feel like every single person that is watching this has gone through that situation or scenario where the chair has some doubts, some questions, some hesitations about your topic, and how do you move forward when they probably, maybe they're in a place where they want to change things. So I'm going to give you a blunt answer, which is build such a strong case from the get-go that there is just simply no possibility of them wanting to change it. And if they do want to change it, they're simply changing it by a matter of degree rather than a change of direction entirely. So how to do that. In chapter, first of all, when you go to a chair, what you might say in general is, uh, well, first of all, the hope is when you go to a chair for the, in the first place is make sure that you just have a pretty solid set of logic in your chapter one. You might not have a full chapter one done, but in my opinion, number one, you want an amazing purpose statement I'll go ahead and I'll link that up in the comments section below. And number two, you want to make sure that your logic is lining up so that way from the first words that you say, you're on a road straight towards that purpose statement. And you can present them this idea and you're presenting it in this way. Is It's not, hey, Mr. Miss Chair, Dr. Dr. Chair, what do you think about this purpose statement? What do you think about this topic? It's more of in the vein of, I'm working to solidify this topic, and this is a topic in progress. I'd love your input now, but just know that what I'm giving you right now is just a work in progress. So that way, when you hand them something firm and solid, an awesome, amazing chapter one, you can say, hey, Mr. or Ms. Chair, Dr. or Dr. Chair, check out uh, what I have for you. This is as solid as I can possibly make it. It's awesome. So, so here you go. So that's, I think, the blunt, straightforward answer is just make sure that your logic is completely solid going forward. Make sure your purpose statement is perfect. And I, I would like to add that there's a way in which that we interact with our chair. And there's two possible ways. Uh, I'll leave out the third way, which is that we're not talking to our chair at all. But option, the two options are this. There's the, the way in which one could approach a chair, which many candidates do, of like, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? It's almost like the, the taste testing. I'm hungry right now, I guess. There's like a taste testing sort of way that we come across to our chair. And what the chair then does is they insert lots of questions and they, have, they, they might provide way too much direction. The second way that we can approach our chair is we can say, check, the, check out this solid draft that I've created. I'd love your input. I feel like I'm really close. And because you've done all that background work ahead of time, everything's solid, there's going to be less likelihood, Kashia, of them changing something on you. Andrea asks, can you talk about conceptual and operational definitions? Andrea, absolutely. Conceptual and operational definitions. So for most people, 
The first place that your definitions are going to start appearing is in the initial paragraphs of chapter one. And the, math, the biggest definitions section that most of us are used to is at the end of chapter one. What I want to say is, at any time that you're invoking a term that is going to be useful in your dissertation, that is, it's probably something that is connected to your purpose statement, then you're wanting to make sure that you have every definition is backed up by the literature. And the way that you do that is you cite an awesome book regarding your definition. So the first place, and in lots of my, uh, my other videos, I've talked about the idea of, you know, you want to start with books, and then you want to work in books and dissertations, and then you want to work into, you know, articles and studies that are online. When you start with books and dissertations, which are harder to find than articles, you know, there's lots of articles online you can get. When you start with books and definitions, you're getting what they call the seminal authors of your field. Because chances are the only people that are going to be published in, in, in the book realm are those big names. Now there's lots of researchers that aren't published in book form, but chances are books are the right place to start. You want to define all your terms in terms of books. Now lots of chairs are going to say, well look, your definition isn't robust enough. You need to make sure that you're including lots of sources. So here's a strategy for that. What you say first is, in a paragraph about a definition, what you'll say is something like, you know, teaching strategies are defined as, and then you give a definition, okay? And then you give like lots of sources, like maybe three or four or five sources that, that define that. Then you can say is something like a sentence like, this definition is derived from the, t the top experts in the last five years of this field. Now, I'm, I'm really not wordsmithing this well live here on camera. I try, I try to make promises not to wordsmith live on camera, but here I'm doing it. But then what you might do is then you say first, and then you say such and such author stated that teaching strategies are defined as. Second, another author defined teaching strategies as this. Finally, this author defined teaching strategies as this. And then you finish off the, the paragraph by saying, therefore, experts in this field or top researchers in this field, citation, define teaching strategies as. And then you provide all the citations again. And then at the end of chapter one, you provide a, a, longer, a longer definition, the, the actual definition itself, excuse me, with the citation at the end. No matter what, you are not creating the definitions in your dissertation. Every conceptual, every operational definition must be directly sourced by the literature, start with books, and then work into dissertations. Natasha asks, my methodologist wants to know how I plan on recording non-worded data like expressions. Can you please speak to that? Natasha, absolutely. The way you do that, and first of all, the fact that you're working with a methodologist tells me that you have someone on your side that can probably provide some advice about this already. I'd love to know what they say. But one of the things that you can do is use a video recorder. And there, in your script, when you're writing your interview protocol, which I talked back in episode three, what you can do is you can talk about, uh, you can talk to your participant about the use of a camera. You want to tell them the camera's there and, and that no one else will be seeing that video. And what you will do is you will record their non-worded expressions using that camera. Uh, some methodologists might dissuade against that. And if that's the case, you know, you're going to have to take some pretty awesome notes. But in my opinion, you know, when you're working with someone and you're interviewing them, you want your full attention there with them. So talk to your methodologist about working with a camera and let us know what they say in the comments section. Everybody, it's been an absolute pleasure meeting with you for episode four. More questions means more episodes. I'd love to hear your questions, so please leave your questions. I would love to know what books and resources are you accessing about your dissertation? Leave me the answer to that in the comment section below. What books and resources are you accessing to help you with your dissertation? And how have they been helpful? Everybody, I'll see you in episode five. If there's an episode five, I need your questions for there to be an episode five. Thanks for joining me. It's an absolute pleasure serving you in the middle of this week. And if you like this video, subscribe. Listen to me in your car on the way to work. Play it to your children.